Hey, what's going on everybody? Matt with Matt Money here. Some of you guys call me Matty Moolah Diamond Hands. That's a different story for a different day. Hope you guys are doing great. I wanted to preface this video talking uh, and giving you guys a little bit of context behind this interview. So it is a sponsored video, but it was a great opportunity to talk to the CEO, Tim Co of Entheon Biomedical Company. And I think it's an interesting one. A lot of you guys follow MindMed. A lot of you guys follow Compass Pathways. And some of you guys are even invested in the psychedelic ETF that we're probably gonna mention briefly in the very beginning of this interview as well. But uh, just wanted to mention just overall that opioid addiction is a huge problem in North America and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I know too many people and know uh, family members, unfortunately, that are either struggling with this currently or have unfortunately lost their lives. And so uh, I get pretty emotional in this one. So hopefully you guys have an opportunity to do some due diligence on this one, see if it's something that you might want to invest in potentially. Uh, I'm gonna do my own due diligence as well. I don't have any shares in the company at the moment, but my purpose and my mind aligns with a lot of their company goals just to make sure that folks don't have to worry about opioid addiction anymore. It's tough. Um, I've seen too many people unfortunately hurt by that. And me and Tim getting a really good personal conversation towards the end of the interview, if you guys are interested in seeing that. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. I'm gonna do my due diligence and see if it's something that I would like to potentially invest in as well um, in the future after my disclosures and stuff are all finalized and everything like that. But uh, do your own due diligence, see if it's something that aligns with your MindMed investment if you guys are MindMed investors or Compass Pathways investors or get exposure to it utilizing the psychedelic ETF on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Let's get to the interview. I'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Matt Money. I'm sitting here with CEO Tim Coe. He is the CEO of uh, Entheon Biomedical Company, uh, which is a, a psychedelic company. First and foremost, I want to congratulate you on the introduction to the psychedelic ETF, the first of its kind in North America. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, yeah. And then also you guys just had a merger as well. Do you want to quickly just uh, announce that and then um, we can get kicked off on some of the other questions that folks might have? Totally, yeah. The, happy to be in good company with the psychedelic ETF. So yeah. we see that as a really important validation step, both for the psychedelic industry and you know to be among uh, quality um, quality peers. Um, and then with regard to the um, acquisition that we did, uh, we recently acquired Halogen Life Sciences, and yeah, we see that as a growing, uh, an increasingly important uh, type of data exercise that we're doing. Uh, we all know that you know psychedelics are, you know, generally safe and super effective in, or potentially very effective in treating these mental health disorders. But uh, we do want to understand from a genetics perspective what the, you know, variables that might constitute a uh, you know, positive reaction for some and a negative reaction for others. And so we see genetics as being a very important data piece in terms of understanding all the multiple variables that go into what makes psychedelic. Uh, what makes psychedelic medicine effective for some and not so much for others? No, that's uh, that's very wise. And I see a lot of other companies going into this space with Virgin uh, Group also doing some 23andMe acquisitions, making sure that they have that sort of background in gene genetic sort of testing as well. And uh, I know me and some of the other folks on my channel are very big into RG. Uh, which is Kathy Wood's sort of movement in the genomic space as well. So that's understandable and, and really cool to see that you're integrating that into your business as a whole. So for those of the folks that are on the channel that are very heavily invested in this space, the psychedelic uh, therapeutic space, psychedelic assisted therapy space, uh, maybe they aren't necessarily the, um, I guess, folks that we're aiming towards this sort of question, but there are some folks that might be tuning in seeing your company for the first time and might not necessarily understand the psychedelic space and more specifically the psychedelic assisted therapy space. Would you mind just giving us a little bit of background on that? And then we'll maybe touch on Entheon as a company itself. Yeah, totally. I think um, for all the sort of new, the neophytes entering the psychedelic um, arena and trying to understand what it is, um, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to harness the potential of you know these massively powerful psychoactive molecules like dmt uh, dmt belongs to a class of drugs or classic psychedelics like mescaline lsd psilocybin um, you know and beyond the sort of cliched maybe memes about what psychedelics are tie-dye and you know tie-dye groovy type of stuff you know from a from a scientific perspective they do 
you know, have a basket of effects that are, you know, ultimately super therapeutically useful. You know, they do create openness and oceanic boundlessness and removal of barriers that in a therapeutic context are nice to have removed. Um, so for a multitude of psychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, as well as things like substance use disorder, um, often there are therapeutic blockages that conventional therapies just don't really have the ability to target these complex internally foundational issues about belief systems, you know, self-perception, uh, optimism, sort of general belief systems. Um, psychedelics really do, in a very targeted way, um, help the individual to operate on those systems. Um, so uh, via a multitude of ways, uh, you know, one of the ones that are sort of conveniently um, characterizes the disruption of default mode network. So um, these psychedelic molecules, when ingested, do create disruptions in brain activity that allow for, you know, new experiences, new perceptions, and that therapeutically useful um, plastic state where people can work on some of their core issues. Okay, no, that's really interesting. And I'm glad you touched on the, the meme aspect of it where folks might be kind of uh, utilizing and, and thinking it from, a, from, I guess, a recreational perspective. I know plenty of folks and, and I've seen more and more folks trying to utilize and microdose certain types of, mm -hmm. of psychedelics, whether it's psilocybin or LSD to be able to unlock not only, um, you know, help them with their depression and anxiety, but also help them from a creativity standpoint as well yeah. and not using it and more so utilizing it for its, uh, its those sort of activities rather than the recreational aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So, but. Speaking about the recreational aspect of it, is there a lot of major hurdles that you were having to face from a regulatory standpoint, either here in North America or even abroad? Because I know you're doing a partnership abroad. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, in the context of rec, we're not so concerned with that. You know, I'm a big proponent of decriminalization and for consenting adults to have access to medicines that are beneficial to them. I mean, they already have whether the law exists, you know, access to these things and whether to criminalize them or not, uh, it'd be nice to not put people in jail for some of the choices they make. Um, for us, we're not targeting a recreational model. Ultimately, you know, the disorders that we're trying to treat are highly medicalized disorders that need to be uh, considered in a medical context. And so the product that we're creating is a medical product for people with, you know, substance use disorder diagnoses. And so um, for us, you know, even though we are working with these, you know, these novel molecules or these, you know, re-examining molecules that I guess regulators have looked at with um, ire, um, ultimately there is a regulatory pathway for us to pursue. And so uh, what we're doing is we're, um, you know, structuring clinical trials to prove out the safety and efficacy of DMT specifically for the purposes of treating addiction. So um, regardless of the de decriminalization or the REC, conversation ultimately the framework that we're using is to have regulators look at this empirically look at the data and make their assessments about safety and efficacy based off of that and have this available as a prescribable medical product mm -hmm. so not much different than what johnson and johnson has done with their ketamine product or abby has done i forget what their product is called but uh, not very different from what they're doing they're kind of utilizing similar sort of uh, I guess, drugs that have previously been utilized from a recreational standpoint, but now to help focus and help with other disorders that could be actually medically um, useful rather than the recreational aspect. Is that kind of what you're mentioning? Yeah, precisely. It's, and I'm, I'm so those bellwether moments about, you know, esketamine being approved and, you know, looking even further or, you know, outside of that to where uh, Compass and um, you know, MAPS is with moving along you know, these illicit substances through that regulatory process. Uh, yeah, that is a pathway that we've chosen. Okay, very cool. And those are supposed to start later this year, correct? Yeah, yeah, in various states of development, yeah, phase two, phase yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, and, and I guess other than other than that, is Entheon looking at any other particular drugs other than DMT to assist with addiction, or is there any other secondary uh, trials that you're gonna be doing uh, utilizing DMT? Yeah, we have some other molecular targets that we're interested in um, looking at, yeah, potential new molecular candidates. Uh, you know, as of this 
stage of uh, things, not uh, nothing to materially disclose, but we're certainly interested. Um, but we do think the DMT for the purposes of uh, the type of therapeutic approach that we're um, conceiving is very much an ideal molecular candidate. It's short acting, it's intense. Um, you know, it can elicit that really profound transformation, but in such a way that, you know, we can modify the time of uh, the duration of effect so that, you know, rather than having these long form psychedelic effects, which uh, from a commercialization perspective, aren't the most scalable. Um, you know, DMT gives us the opportunity to create those really profound, super important, uh, you know, foundationally profound uh, experiences, but doing so in such a way where we can, you know, potentially help physicians and practitioners um, have higher patient throughput. So creating shorter experiences, but also lessening the potential for a negative adverse reaction. Um, you know, these long form psychedelics will sometimes have during the duration of effect, you know, whether it's four to eight hours, have people that simply aren't prepared and uh, maybe have a therapeutically not useful experience, whether it's too distressing or there's just something that they can't deal with. In those long form experiences, there is no real off switch, but with DMT um, administered the way that we're proposing, um, you know, if a person does run into a situation where they say, hey, I'm really not ready during this session and it's actually becoming highly distressing to me, then we can stop the experience and have that person return to a functional baseline within about 15 minutes and not have it be this new trauma or this new scary thing that they never want to approach again. Right. No, that's interesting. And I've and I've I've listened to Joe Rogan in the past on either on, it was either on his podcast or talking about it on one of his stand-up shows, but his experience with it was prolific. I mean, he 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 experienced it and he said he basically walked out of it a, a different person. Uh, you know, whether, I mean, you look at it from a recreational standpoint or even a therapeutic standpoint, I think you could say it could potentially have been both in his case, but it seems like it's something that is definitely something that could be honed in and utilized in the future for medicinal purposes, whether that is from an addictional standpoint or an anxiety standpoint to assist with that going forward. So interesting to, to kind of see that space evolve. But talking a little bit about that, um, I mean, you do have some competitors in the psychedelic space, not necessarily from a DMT, utilizing DMT space, but I guess I just want to ask the question about Compass and MindMed and how what you are doing differs and where there might be pros and cons. Uh, mm -hmm. So specifically talking about Compass, they're utilizing psilocybin uh, to specifically focus on anxiety, depression, as well as addiction. So they're kind of looking at a, a suite of different um, uses for for their psilocybin sort of project. And then you also have MindMed, who a lot of my folks on the channel watch a good bit. They have Project Lucy, uh, which is obviously microdosing LS. Is that LSD? Yeah, I think so. And that also has very, I think that's specifically for anxiety. And then you also mm -hmm. have 18MC, which I think is their opioid uh, addiction sort of treatment. And I'm not yeah. sure exactly what 18MC, the, the psychedelic aspect of it is, but um but yeah i'm curious to see from a from your perspective how utilizing those particular substances is is different in either the pros and cons compared to what antheon is doing with dmt yeah totally so no you know compass is we all benefit from company compass existing i think it's uh there was sort of the, the pioneer within the space and so you know, I touched on it briefly. The you know the reality is that psilocybin is amazing. It is a amazing potential therapeutic. It's you know we've seen its application in the world of you know um, depression, treatment resistant depression, major depressive disorder, um, as well as things like nicotine addiction. One of our advisors, Matt Johnson, uh, did some early study in terms of psilocybin's efficacy in treating people with nicotine addiction, and the efficacy rates are amazing. It's like you know, never before seen stuff, right? right. Like better than Zyban and the patch and gum and all that stuff. Um, you know, but we do understand that these classic psychedelics do operate similarly on, you know, core set of receptors, 5-HT2A primarily, Sigma-1. There are a variety of receptors that they primarily act on. Um, and we understand that with, you know, we often characterize DMT as the thing that takes you to the aliens. That isn't always the case. Real, realistically, right. like, you know, DMT, if there's a dial, um, you know, a seven out of 10 on DMT is very similar to a potential nine or 10 out of 10 on five grams of psilocybin. So 
we understand that a lot of the same characteristics and components of the psilocybin experience can be derived of DMT. But unlike the psilocybin experience, which is four to six hours long and has those scaling and safety issues, DMT can be done so in such a way where, you know, from a throughput, throughput and safety perspective, you can tailor and shorten those experiences and have more more modular potentially if there is need for broken up therapeutic approaches um, rather than trying to tackle the entire mountain of self in one six hour long session you could potentially break that up into a multitude of targeted sessions around you know say specific features of that person's life narrative or memory um, so it does have some more flexibility there um, and so we see it as being, you know, I will never speak ill of psilocybin. Psilocybin has been an amazing teacher for me. And I think as a sort of, um, yeah, the thing that we all rallied around, psilocybin is great, but there are certain limitations to it. So uh, hopefully that answers the question with regard to psilocybin. Um, and then with regard to some of the other things, you know, um, my men does so much amazing stuff. They really do. And, you know, in terms of you know generating legitimacy as well as awareness um, again the psychedelic industry is uh, better for them being around um, and i do think their 18 mc approach is very interesting in that it does remove some of the i guess potential dangers or the uncertainty associated with hey this really powerful psychedelic experience um, and you know, it's if if they could move that through the process of clinical trials, I'd be really interested to see what the what effects are derived of a non psychedelic um, derivative of ibogaine. Um, to my understanding, and to my from my philosophical basis, I do think in order for individuals to have that fundamentally important transformation of self that it does take a bit of psychedelia. It does take a, you know, a challenging, complex experience to recontextualize stuff. So that being said, I'm really excited to see what happens out of a non-psychedelic uh, type of attempt. But I do think the DMT is pretty purpose-built to elicit that really profound uh, shift. And so, um, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. And I, I noticed as well, just from looking at things from a different perspective, whether it's from you know moving to a different country or just trying something new, whether it's a new type of food or, or anything, those sorts of experiences really assist in the way that you might look at things. And so I don't think it's very much different other than just utilizing, say, a psychedelic to be able to do the same thing and, and see things from a different perspective and also kind of change the mindset. Um, and so I think that they're, they're all, different ways to almost achieve the same thing. So I, I appreciate uh, appreciate that in context. Do you personally have any, uh, I guess, tie or a personal story associated with utilizing psychedelics specifically for addiction or, or anything else like anxiety uh, that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, at, yeah, as a public trade CEO, um, I maybe shouldn't be talking about this, but I've talked about it enough. So cat's out of the bag. Um, yeah, no, in my life, I used, um, of course, I used psychedelics in my teens, and they were pretty transformational. I was a pretty uh, pent-up, uh, church-going kid, maybe anxious about the, you know, theological implications of existence a bit too much, and it drove me to pretty intense anxiety. Um, and so it was interesting in that my exposure to that really did help me broaden my horizons and, you know, sort of soften the edges of life a bit for me. <clears throat> but then in my 20s, you know, um, as additional context, I have a, I lost a brother to addiction in March of 2019. Um, and that took place over you know 20 years, right? It didn't happen overnight. It was a sort of process, uh, descent, if you will, into further addiction. Um, and it was really predicated on some traumas that took place, both from a, you know, family of origin perspective, as well as a very acute incident that took place that rendered him incapable of engaging in society. I'll just leave it at right. that. Um, and so he self-medicated um, and yeah, the, the sort of family condition didn't make it easy for him to feel compassion for himself. And then, you know, he found that drugs were useful in relieving him of distress. But then as that became the only option, you know, his life became more chaotic and the conditions of his life only perpetuated the need for more drug use, right? It's that terrible cycle that we see. And then, about three or four years ago, I became responsible for the care of my brother just because my parents were didn't know what to do, what was enabling, what was helping. 
Um, and I've worked through some issues in my life uh, with regard to my own mental health that I'll go into um, that made it appropriate that I sort of see the care of my brother over or oversee the care of my brother. And over the course of about two years, you know, he was in multiple treatment centers on methadone, suboxone, uh, antidepressants, anxieties, and psych antipsychotics, hundreds of hours, if not thousands, psychotherapy, um, electroconvulsive therapy um, in multiple you know, mental health institutions and recovery centers, and nothing stuck, right? They all, we were all trying to drive at that foundationally important change, you know, the unveiling of who your core self is. Um, but due to the nature of trauma, there are just so many walls and barriers that ultimately he succumbed to an overdose. Um, but yeah, I come from the same household that built my brother. So some of the same conditioning and barriers that I built up in my 20s, I said, hey, I don't want to live like this. I'm going to do some pretty pointed therapies around this stuff. And I engage in a very intensive trauma therapy endeavor. Um, but yeah, you know, those barriers and features of your life are pretty strong. And so after some pretty intensive EMDR and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy stuff, I said, I still found myself at a bit of a roadblock, not a bit of a roadblock, a very visceral roadblock where I was in essentially fight or flight for the better part of two years, characterized by a ton of aggression, a ton of anxiety, and a ton of just self-imposed expectation and then disappointment, shame cycle stuff um, that I just, I was drowning underneath. And um, someone introduced DMT into my life and um, over the course of non-directed self-treatment, so just me being a, a goofball and self-administering DMT uh, many times a night for about a week and a half, I was able to do in those sessions what I was trying to do in a lifetime of therapy. It really did help me recontextualize how I felt about myself, my prospects, um, my relationships, what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a son, a brother, and allowed me to have compassion for others and in doing so have compassion for myself. And for the first time in what felt like a long time, it didn't feel like I was drowning. So, yeah. Um, and I think that that sense of unburdening, that sense of coming up for air um, and yeah, through that novel experience, like accessing memories and seeing things that I could not envision for myself, you know, for a person with really, really deeply entrenched drug addiction issues or with the type of negative self-beliefs and the history of traumatic experience where you know over time you envision that negativity and you know disappointment is to be expected having that novel perspective having that novel perspective and seeing that whoa you know i like you know my brain is capable of thinking things that i wasn't aware of and of you know maybe recontextualizing hey maybe i don't hate that person anymore and maybe i don't need to be so hard on myself hey maybe i don't need to blame myself for things going wrong and maybe the world is okay and things will be all right that is of crucial importance you know for someone who might feel like they're at their wits end and possibilities don't exist no i really appreciate you telling me that story and uh, I, I did want to kind of save that for the end because you know i i did kind of mention to you before we got on air that i personally have a connection to this sort of uh area specifically and i feel like a lot of people within north america will have the same problem uh, mm -hmm. a, a connection to addiction someone in my family unfortunately lost their life last year and so uh kyle who's my business partner you'll talk to him in just a few moments but um he introduced me to uh utilizing and uh the uh, or not utilizing, but the investment in, say, mind med and, and the similar space, the psychedelic space to help attack this legitimate epidemic that we're seeing across the United States from opioid addiction. And I mean, like like you said, you, you had to deal with the eventual downfall over the course of 20 years. I also had to deal with it for eight years in my family as well. And um, we're still dealing with the, the um, I guess, the, the repercussions of unfortunately losing a loved one because of opioid addiction. So uh, that, that truly hits home. And I, you know, was trying to choke back tears. I don't know if you saw, but, um, very, uh, very admirable that you can talk about it so diligently and so, um, so professionally without, you know, getting so emotional. It's truly, 
truly uh, cool to see, especially that it's, it's still relatively young for you. I mean, it's been less than two years that you've had to experience something like this and you're able to, to, I guess, explain it in such a, I guess, positive way, as well as, you know, so professionally uh, and relate it back to what the true purpose of Entheon is, is really looking after. So, I mean, I, I feel like we could either cut it at this point and, and leave it on that specific note, or you can talk about some of the great folks that you also have on your team as well. I, I noticed a lot of folks from John Hopkins and many other folks that are helping leading you down this vision. So I'll leave that decision up to you. No, I, no, and I appreciate that. And thank you for that commentary and also for sharing what you've been through. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Like we come to these, viewing these statistics, we lose, I mean, month on month in a small city in Vancouver, where I live, we lose month on month, like more people to opioid overdose than we do to COVID-19. And it's like, it's nobody talks just, about it. <laughs> yeah. And the scope of it is like, you know, encapsulated in numbers and statistics, it's, it's shocking. But then when you realize that like the number of sleepless nights and, you know, for my brother, I remember the thing, and this is where I lose my professionalism a bit, but my brother sincerely, he would tell me like with tears in his voice, I want to get better. I want to get better. I'm trying my best, but like, you know, I just can't. Um, yeah, yeah. Knowing, know, knowing that that exists and despite the sincere efforts of medical health professionals, as well as the individuals that are suffering, um, that there those blockages just can't be chipped away at with the conventional approaches. It's It does become a thing that like becomes so heart-wrenching that you know, it did really inform the approach that we took. Like, you know, falling, I just couldn't shake it. I was so frustrated, but also so emboldened. And knowing the lengths that we went to from a cost perspective, as well as the time and emotional labor that we really threw at this, like it was a loved one. We'd give everything and like everything that we could in terms of the money, as well as my time and my talking to professionals and trying to coordinate care. Like it is a uh, cost beyond money right yeah. um yeah. and so understanding that and having that so that's so visceral and um you know just, just you know my passion and my experience and my frustration alone can't build a business and so um <clears throat> you know following my brother's death and of course the sort of uh mourning period you know i understood that in order to build a scientifically sound company that will you know, bring something to market that it has to be rooted in research. And so something that we immediately did was reach out to the smartest people in the psychedelic research space. And so I flew to Germany uh, with no more than an email introduction to some of our advisors and really tried to articulate our, our, our seriousness about treating uh, people like my brother, really articulating that there is a population of people that's suffering without help right now. And tried to validate, hey, what can psychedelics help people like my brother? And if so, what is an approach to creating something that will help them from molecule selection to how it's delivered? How can we actually create something that helps? And so yeah, people like you know Matthew Johnson, Robin Bart Harris, Christopher Timmerman, Dennis McKenna, you know, beyond being just high name recognition people, they were super informative in terms of saying, well, the limitations of these molecules are this, and the benefits of these molecules are this. And ultimately through an iterative process, they have been very meaningfully engaged in determining which molecule, how long, um, at what pace do you on-ramp the experience, what gauge of needle do you use, as well as in the therapeutics, you know, what psychotherapies work and what is minimally invasive so that this has a chance of being something that is widely adopted and scalable. And so uh, we're honored. We're super honored that, um, you know, the people on our advisory team have uh, bought in and contributed so meaningfully. Yeah, it's, it's definitely awesome. I mean, just looking at the website, I mean, folks from all all different types of universities across the globe, it's, it's really inspiring to see. And it's a really mm -hmm. admirable cause and purpose of the organization. And it's something that I'm deeply, I guess, connected to, you know, over the past eight years, having to see exactly what you mentioned, the the, the time, uh, the agony, the money that was spent, the emotions that to this day continue to live on, like, could we have done something else? And 
to be honest, the only other thing that we could have tried is is psychedelics. And I remember my sister mentioning it as well. And unfortunately, we never got the opportunity to try it. And uh, it, it's a shame that it's really starting to to come into its own in late 2020, early 2021. Um, and wish we could have had the opportunity to to do something as well um, to to hopefully do this. But really, we'll be watching this space for sure uh, going forward. And I, I truly, truly appreciate one the the personal connection that you and I were able to share, and then also the the ability to take a quick look at your company. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, we're committed to seeing this through. Um, and yet we're working as fast and as diligently as we can to really bring something uh, to market that, um, yeah, so we can prevent uh, the loss of additional life. And uh, beyond that, really um, give people the opportunity not just to, you know, stop themselves from, you know, dying, but to live a really fulfilled, meaningful life. Um, because ultimately, if you can create meaning, um, yeah, you create uh, reasons for going on. So um, I appreciate the time and uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I know it's a complex story, but uh, for any audience members that want to learn more, I encourage them to uh, visit us at entheonbiomedical.com. Uh, we have a lot of uh, really interesting projects that we're working on that will, you know, beyond just the clinical trial approval, um, you know, really working to better understand what constitutes uh, various mental health, uh, you know, problems, um, both from a genetics perspective as well as a brain activity and sort of brain uh, construction perspective. Um, and yeah, ultimately, we're trying to create things that help people, but also creating tools to give physicians uh, the choice, the tools that they need to uh, better prescribe uh, personalized medicine to their uh, their individual patients. Very good. Tim, thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Yeah, it worked out. Cool. Cheers. I, Thank you so I much. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Absolutely. Bye bye.